Friend Patience by Guy de Maupassant. What became of Laramie? Oh, he's captain in the Six Dragoons. And Pinson? He's a sub-prefect. And Racolet? Dead. We were searching for other names which would remind us of the youthful faces of our younger days. Once in a while we had met with some of these old comrades, bearded, bald, married, fathers of several children, and the realization of these changes had given us an unpleasant shudder, reminding us how short life is, how everything passes away, how everything changes. My friend asked me, and patience, fat patience. I almost howled. Oh, well, as for him, just listen to this. Four or five years ago, I was in Limoges on a tour of inspection, and I was waiting for dinner time. I was seated before the big cafe in the Place du Théâtre, just bored to death. The tradespeople were coming by twos, threes, or fours to take their absinthe or vermouth, and talking all the time of their own or other people's business, laughing loudly or lowering their voices in order to impart some important or delicate piece of news. I was saying to myself, what shall I do after dinner? And I thought of the long evening in this provincial town, of the slow, dreary walk through the unknown streets, of the impression of deadly gloom which these provincial people produce on the lonely traveler, and of the whole oppressive atmosphere of the place. I was thinking of all these things as I watched the little jets of gas flare up, feeling my loneliness increase with the falling shadows. Well, a big fat man sat down at the next table and called in a stentorian voice, Waiter, my bitters. The my came out like the report of a cannon. Well, immediately understood that everything was in his life and not another's. That he had his nature, by Jove. His appetite, his trousers, his everything. His more absolutely and more completely than anyone else's. Well, then he looked round him with a satisfied air. His bitters were brought, and he ordered, My newspaper! And I wondered, well, which newspaper can his be? The title would certainly reveal to me his opinions and his theories, his principles, his hobbies, and his weaknesses. The waiter brought the toms. I was surprised. Why the tom? A serious, somber, doctrinaire, impartial sheet? Well, I thought, he must be a serious man, with settled and regular habits. In short, a good bourgeois. He put on his gold-rimmed spectacles, leaned back before beginning to read, and once more glanced about him. He noticed me, and immediately began to stare at me in an annoying manner. I was even going to ask the reason for this detention when he exclaimed from his seat, Well, if by all that's holy, if this isn't gantrin la droit? And I answered, Yes, monsieur, you're not mistaken. Then he quickly rose and came towards me with hands outstretched. Well, old man, how are you? As I did not recognize him at all, I was greatly embarrassed, and I stammered, well, well, very well, and you? He began to laugh. I bet you don't recognize me. Well, no, not exactly. It seems, however, he slapped me on the back. Come on, no joking. I am Patience, Robert Patience, your friend, your chum. Well, I recognized him. Yes, Robert Patience, my old college chum. It was he. I took his outstretched hand. And how are you? Oh, fine. His smile was like a pain of victory. He asked, What are you doing here? I explained that I was a government inspector of taxes. He continued, pointing to my red ribbon. Then you have been a success. I answered, Fairly so. And you? Oh, I am doing well. What are you doing? I'm in business. Making money? Oh, heaps. I'm very rich. But come around to lunch tomorrow at noon, 17 Rue de Coquichon. You will see my place. He seemed to hesitate a second and then continued. Are you still the good sport that you used to be? I hope so. Not married? No. Good. And do you still love a good time and potatoes? Well, now I was beginning to find him hopelessly vulgar. Nevertheless, I answered, Yes. And pretty girls? Oh, most assuredly. He began to laugh good-humoredly. Good, good. Do you remember our first escapade in Bordeaux at that dinner in Routes? What a spree. 
Well, I did indeed remember that spree, and the recollection of it cheered me up. This called to mind other pranks. He would say, Say, do you remember the time when we locked the proctor up in Old Man Latoc's cellar? And he laughed and banged the table with his fist. And then he continued, Yes, 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 and do you remember the face of the geography teacher, Monsieur Moran, the day we set off a firecracker in the globe, just as he was haranguing about the principal volcanoes of the earth? Then I suddenly asked him, And you, are you married? He exclaimed, Ten years, my boy, and I have four children, remarkable youngsters, but you'll see them and their mother. We were talking rather loud, and the people around us looked at us and surprised. Well, suddenly my friend looked at his watch, a chronometer the size of a pumpkin, and he cried, Well, thunder! I'm sorry, but I'll have to leave you. I'm never free at night. He rose, took both my hands, shook them as though he were trying to wrench my arms from their sockets, and exclaimed, So long, then, till tomorrow noon. Uh, so long. I spent the morning working in the office of the Collector General of the Department. The chief wished me to stay to luncheon, but I told him I had an engagement with a friend. As he had to go out, he accompanied me. I asked him, Can you tell me how I can find the Rue de Coquichon? He answered, Well, yes, it's only five minutes' walk from here. As I have nothing special to do, I will take you there. We started out and soon found ourselves there. It was a fine, wide-looking street on the outskirts of the town. I looked at the houses, and I noticed number 17. It was a large house with a garden behind it. The facade, decorated with frescoes in the Italian style, appeared to me as being in bad taste. There were goddesses holding vases and others swathed in clouds. Two stone cupids supported the number of the house. I said to the treasurer, Well, here is where I'm going. I held out my hand to him. He made a quick, strange gesture, said nothing, and shook my hand. I rang. A maid appeared, asked, and I asked, Monsieur Patience, if you please. She answered, Please right here, sir. Is it to monsieur that you wish to speak? Yes. The hall was decorated with paintings from the brush of some local artist. Pauls and Virginias were kissing each other under palm trees bathed in a pink light. A hideous oriental lantern was ranging from the ceiling. Several doors were concealed by bright hangings. But what struck me especially was the odor. It was a sickening and perfumed odor, reminding one of rice powder and the moldy smell of a cellar an indefinable odor of a heavy atmosphere as oppressive as that as public baths. Well, I followed the maid up a marble stairway, covered with a green oriental carpet, and was ushered into a sumptuous, a sumptuous parlor. Well, left alone, I looked about me. The room was richly furnished, but in the pretentious state of a parvenu. Rather fine engravings of the last century represented women with powdered hair, dressed high, surprised by gentlemen in interesting positions. Another lady lying in a large bed was teasing her with her foot a little dog who was lost in the sheets. One drawing showed four feet and bodies concealed behind a curtain. The large room surrounded by soft couches was entirely impregnated with that enervating and insipid odor which I'd already noticed. There seemed to be something suspicious about the walls and the hangings, the exaggerated luxury, everything. I approached the window to look into the garden. It was very big and shady and beautiful. A wide path wound round a glass, grass plot in the midst of which was a fountain, and entered a shrubbery and came out farther away. And suddenly yonder in the distance, between two clumps of bushes, three women appeared. They were walking slowly, arm in arm, clad in long white tea gowns covered with lace. Two were blondes and the other was dark-haired. Almost immediately they disappeared again behind the trees. Well, I stood there entranced, delighted with this short and charming apparition which brought to my mind a whole world of poetry. They had scarcely allowed themselves to be seen in just the proper light, in that frame of foliage, in the midst of that mysterious, delightful park. Well, it seemed to me that I had suddenly seen before me the great ladies of the last century, who were depicted in the engravings on the wall. And I began to think of the happy, joyous, witty, and amorous times when manners were so graceful and lips so approachable. A deep voice, a deep voice made me jump up. Patience had come in, beaming, and held out his hands to me. He looked into my eyes with the sly look which one takes when divulging secrets of love, and with a Napoleonic gesture, he showed me his sumptuous parlor, his park. The three women who had reappeared in the back of it, then in a triumphant voice where the note of pride was prominent, and he said, 
and to think that I began with nothing, my wife and my sister-in-law.